Today, we are going to be talking about Transformers The Last Night and All Eyes on Me, so stay tuned. Welcome to The Real Review. Welcome to The Real Review, sponsored by Parametric and Lazy Ape Studios, where you get some of the latest happenings, real thoughts, and perspectives in the world of film and television. And everybody, today, I am here with Joel Witwicky Cunningham. I like it. Yeah. That's... Yeah, he actually made a slight cameo. What a wiki in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very, very slight brief, which I thought was the funniest part of the entire film. If there was a funny part <laughs> in the entire was, film. Well, it was the photo they used because yeah. it was like, right. Well, that was in the first uh, Transformers movie. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it, it was very, that was a good callback. The one good callback they've done in Transformers. Shia is still raking in the Shia's, dough. Yeah, he is. He's <laughs> killing it from those movies. I never watched it, but supposedly, apparently, there's a YouTube clip of him and he went to a theater, and I think for 24 hours, he watched all of his films. I did see that. Did you see that? Yeah. And he's like crying at parts and laughing at parts. That's just so weird. Th- there were times where he was like shrinking down in his seat in embarrassment. Yeah, <laughs> I'm guessing. I'm wondering if he watched, uh, what was the other show that he did? Is it Even Stevens? Oh, right. yeah, but I think he just did his movies. He, okay. Yeah. I would go to an Even probably Stevens just during that. Revenge of the Fallen. <laughs> he's like, this one, doesn't yeah. make any sense right now. At yeah. All. <laughs> there you go. Well, and I am here with Matt dances like a robot hey hey you know robots gotta have their say on the dance floor too joel yeah i guess you gotta <laughs> stay well oiled in the joints i actually have never seen you dance before so, so you I might could, dance well, hey guys i'm dancing right now like a robot matt <laughs> dance like a robot <laughs> dun, 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 dun. yeah <laughs> it's a sight to behold <laughs> it's a sight to behold so yeah <laughs> anyways anyway moving on we got that part out of the way yeah um yeah, so welcome. If you're here for the first time, this is a real review where we uh, kind of approach uh, film and uh, how we see them from two opposite ends of the spectrum. You have the critic side, which is Joel. He's very much uh, analytical, uh, critical, somewhat negative at times, oh, I knew you were and go there. it tends to get uh, you know on my <laughs> it nerves. Negative too. Yeah, oh, <laughs> I get on your nerves. I'm kidding. You know, in a very uh, friendly, uh, getting on my nerves kind I'm of like way. an overly aggressive puppy. Right. Sure. <laughs> like, yes. When I'm biting, and it's like that's mildly yeah, annoying. What are you doing that, that is for? Mildly annoying. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, go. Don't chew on the couch. We just yeah. got the couch. Well, you're supposed to pee outside, dog. Yeah. Exactly. And then I'm um, I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum where I'm more on. Uh, the emotional, I'm in it for the experience. Was it enjoyable? Did I connect with the characters? Did I connect with the story? I can I overlook some things. Did I might mind? be emotionally uh-huh. unstable. I might be <laughs> weeping for no apparent reason at all. And the whole day I might be affected by the movie I just saw. He stands up in the theaters and go, how dare you? Right. When so he doesn't like it. Combined, yeah. we uh, like to join forces and create what's called a real review. So you get both you perspectives. So for those people who might be more like Joel or people that might be more <laughs> like me, we'll have costumes one of these days. Exactly. Matt. Yeah, exactly. So anyways, um, also there are a few ways to get connected with us. Joel, if you want to kind of briefly run down how that'll work. If yeah. You, for you, if you've not gotten connected with for us. For sure. All. Yeah. we got the website, which is realviewmedia.com. We've got Facebook, facebook.com slash realviewmedia and Twitter and Instagram, which are both at Real Review Media. And then lastly, we'd love to hear from our listeners. You can always email us, which is realreviewmedia at gmail.com. Boom. Boom. There's the, the robot dynamite. Yes, <laughs> the robot dynamite. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and just- The uh, robotomite. Yeah, robotomite. <laughs> That's interesting. That yeah. sounds like something. I don't know what that sounds like, but it sounds uh, like something. Either. Yeah. So let's go ahead and talk about your favorite movie of the year. Joel, I want to dive right into this thing. And Which uh, one? Because there's two to choose right, from here. I know. So this is the the highly anticipated by someone. Uh, <laughs> by probably Michael in, Bay. Right. I think Michael Bay this every time. The... I can see Michael Bay doing that Shia LaBeouf thing where he sits in the theater and he watches all his films, except he's going to be like, yeah. the whole time. So we're going to talk about uh, Transformers The Last Night. Yes. And um, Spelled K-N-I, not like N-I-G-H. Michael Bay was like, I saw The Dark Knight back in 2008 and- I always wanted to name a Transformers movie, something like that. Yeah. So um, let me go ahead and give the the breakdown on it. Okay. Um, Autobots and Decepticons are at war. You um, lost me. I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> you lost me all right. No, I'm kidding. I feel like that's a new direction for this story. Yeah. Uh, with humans on, this, on the sidelines, Optimus Prime is gone. The key to saving our future lies buried in the secrets of the past in the hidden history of Transformers on Earth. 
uh, directed by the world's greatest director, Michael Bay, mm-hmm. um, and stars Mark Wahlberg, Anthony Hopkins, Josh Dumal, uh, Laura Haddock, Santiago Cabrera, Isabel Monaire, Jared, uh, Gerard Carmichael, Stanley Tucci, yeah. and uh, a score of other people. You can pretty much, I mean, you can pretty much boil it down to like um, Mark Wahlberg, Laura Haddock, and Anthony Hopkins, and then the rest of them are just like cameo appearances. I think <laughs> we should talk about the pauses, but one thing I will say just at the get go here was like everybody that was in this film for the most part was completely unnecessary except for like those three people or so. Right. The rest of the cast was kind of just there to like do like point this, like, dialogue exposition right. <laughs> you know it's inciting incident like that was all the, the reason that they had to be there so um and i will say this as well i felt like out of all the bay films that i've seen he's known for his bayisms you yeah. know the way that he can just like make films that are the most ridiculous i thought that the last knight which i'm calling it i don't yeah. know why the last knight was the least in a while bayish type film it felt discombobulated which I'm used to with a Michael Bay film but to the point where at times it really didn't even feel like a lot of the Bayisms were kind of like seeping out of it now it had the bad story structure of a Michael Bay film right and the things just (laughs) happening and random bits of action and you know explosion and person just you know running and shooting in slow-mo with you know but it didn't really have that progression that story progression of like a Michael Bay film. How did you feel? Did you feel similarly? Yeah, okay. So maybe we should talk about the positives. Let's first. talk about the okay. positives. Yeah. Um okay, moving on to the negatives. <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. If you so, missed it, yeah. <laughs> we um, didn't say anything. That's why. Let's uh let's talk about the positives maybe. And and we've talked about this a number of times. Uh, not a lot of people are looking forward to this. In fact yeah. the numbers came out recently and it's the lowest opening for the Transformers series. Yeah. It's doing um, well overseas, foreign, yeah, in yes. foreign markets internationally. So darn you, China! Right, um, <laughs> we're gonna get more of these because of you now. <laughs> but and this is maybe the second or third time Michael Bay has said this that he's actually this is his last one. But we'll we'll see. Yeah. Um. So when they're throwing as much money at him visually, as they are. um, and this is what I predicted. Visually, had a lot of really cool things. Yeah, a lot of really cool visual elements. Um, a lot of fighting. However, I will say this. I was surprised at how little the actual robots fought. Yeah. I felt like there was a lot less robot fighting in this. Um, there was a lot of really... If you're if you're into the military, let me just say you get a lot of really cool shots of military-related things. Yeah. Um, and then the explosions, the action was pretty pretty cool. Um, yeah. I, I would agree. And I think... One of the this good things we're talking about good yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. I felt like the slight, uh, like kind of arc that Bumblebee went on yeah. in the story was actually somewhat rewarding. Right. I thought that was kind of fun and the way they played that up. And are we gonna do spoilers? I'm trying to figure out. If we should. No, spoil. not yet. Okay. Not yet. But just what happens later on in the yeah. film when he has a confrontation with one of the other, you know, robots, um, transformers. I should say, not robots. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They're aliens. Come on. Yeah, I thought it was rewarding to yeah. have that after going through so many films, and even in this film having different yeah. elements there. So I thought that was rewarding, and I also did like this film felt more human driven. Yeah. It felt more about the human people, and yes, the, obviously there was huge impacts of what was happening with the robots and a big element of the story of the you know the the robots world the the transformers world combining with the earth world right um but it still felt like it was primarily being driven forward by the the human characters yeah which is more relatable and understandable and more enjoyable yeah i agree i think uh, you're right bumblebee did have the a, a bigger arc and probably his biggest kind of more impactful role since the first transformers yeah um and it does make me excited to um to see a standalone Bumblebee movie mm. uh that takes place in the 80s. We talked about this on our on our um coming soon a new segment last week, but uh Travis Knight's directing a Bumblebee spin-off film that takes place in the eighties and it's right. gonna be like it's they're calling it it's gonna be like uh the Iron Giant mm. of the Transformers, which is great. I think if they can go that route and just get a lot of the Michael Bayisms out of there, that'd be totally fine. But yeah. Other than that, I I'd think, be interested to see that. Right. There's right. nothing about the story in and of itself that makes me hate it. Yeah. Because it's just I mean, yeah, if some people aren't going to like it because it's action and sci-fi, but there's nothing about the Transformers innately that I'm like, oh, I hate the fact that they're Transformers, you know? Right. It's really just the Bayisms that have made it bad. Yeah. And the writing and the story and the, um, and the yeah. acting. and the, it's, but, Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So, um, no, that's fine. And mm-hmm. um, honestly, for me, that's that's where it ends. 
Okay. As far as my positives. Um, uh, let me think here. Anything else? Sound design was always... Yeah, obviously that's good. You know, good. He always does a great job with the little nits, the little nicks and things of happen, like things action happening and hearing little sound effects. Um, there was, although I don't know if you had this happen. It was the weirdest thing. There was literally a scene that takes place about a maybe like maybe twenty five minutes and twenty twenty five minutes in, where they're first getting to the junkyard, mm-hmm. and one of the transformers, I forget which one. Uh, the general one with the cigar, yeah. throws a frag grenade right. and it blows up. He does it twice. The first time, it didn't make any noise at all. And it was, I. it almost felt like an editing mistake where they had forgotten to like- I didn't like, catch that. Get the sound effect for it because you saw dirt, like I saw dirt go like, like up into the sky, but it just went up and then came back down. <laughs> and it felt really weirdly, like the audio felt really off. Right, I didn't, I didn't experience that. Yeah, so maybe it was just me. Yeah, it's probably I don't just you. You probably had selective <laughs> hearing. I, I, you only hear you only hear certain <laughs> frag grenade frequencies, Joel. I, I, that's my limit. That's my limit is you know only so many frag grenades in one film. And yeah, I had reached my max capacity. And then you can't hear. But the I heard the one later, so never mind. Yeah. So, <laughs> but sound design was okay. Special effects were good. Um, there wasn't anything about this film that. We haven't really seen before with this type of special effect and visual effects, but it wasn't like a, a step back visually. It was kind of just right, the right. same. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, acting wise, everything was just meh. You yeah. know, Mark Wahlberg was at his Mark Wahlberg, Wahlbergist. Okay. Like he does that. Okay. Like one of yeah. his first lines, like, hey, yeah. Hey, do you want me to punch you in the <laughs> face really hard? Yeah. Is it the funny I kind of giggled at that for what is it? I think maybe just because I'm so used to hearing all the parodies. I'm like, hey, my name is Mark, Mark Wahlberg. Do you want me to punch you in the face well, really hard? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I'm trying to remember the, the sketch from Saturday Night Live where Mark Wahlberg talks to animals. San- Andy Samberg. Yeah, which is played yeah. by Andy Samberg, which is hilarious. And he does that part where he's like, hey. he's like, hey, everybody wants to eat you. I just want to talk to you. And then when he gets done, he always goes, say hi to your mother for me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really funny because there's a scene where uh, the little girl, the young girl that was in the story which again she was completely unnecessary to me she didn't really do anything except, as were 50 percent of the characters right in the yeah movie. but she's at this point and she's you know obviously she's looking at mar walbert as like this father figure because her parents are dead and she goes you know if your daughter was here right now what would you tell her and i was like thinking he should go say hi to your mother for me yeah, okay yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like <laughs> been the perfect moment for that line and it, it's not good we're getting the natives now so um, yeah Let's dive into yeah. the negatives. <laughs> the, 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 it's not good when you're like, you're thinking of better lines. When you're in a film and you're like thinking of, well, that would have been a better line. And especially when it's one like that, where it's like obviously a joke. Yeah. Um, I mean, overall, the thing that I would say outside of the last 15 to 20 minutes of the film, which I kind of enjoyed actually, I felt like it was a good action set piece with rising stakes and it was interesting and it wasn't something we'd kind of seen before in the you know Transformers world of these two massive planets and right. I thought that was kind of cool um, in the play with the gravity and stuff. I didn't necessarily think that they were going to fail, but I was wondering if maybe they were going to set things up for like a sequel or something with how that concluded itself and maybe one of the Transformers would die or something like that. But um I thought that was good. Outside of that, the rest of the film I really just felt was kind of boring and very disjointed. Oh, yeah. And boring enough to the point where they actually had not just one, but two people. And I was going to see this movie at 9 o'clock at night on a Tuesday, which is, you know, kind of late and is a weeknight. Right. But they both were sleeping. And they both <laughs> at different times started snoring. In stereo. Yeah, in stereo. <laughs> and I mean, the people next to them were like, Get on, you know, wake up, you know. <laughs> it was a really boring film. At the same time, I don't feel like it was overly long i felt like it didn't feel like they were taking any elements and and stretching them it Mm. felt like to me to me it felt like um i felt like it was too long okay (laughs) i could have used less things in the film but it didn't feel like they were just throwing things necessarily to like they had these long awkward moments or like this un you know ridiculous dialogue like everything was there i just would have liked it structured differently if that makes sense. I think they could have cut like 30 minutes of just scenes <laughs> that didn't need to be in it. Okay. And there was definitely some. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I mean, most of the scenes of like, um, I don't know, like when the, I don't, I'm not, I don't even know. I'm trying to think right now what scenes. I mean, most of them would just be dialogue scenes between some of the characters where they make the stupid cheesy jokes that nobody cares about yeah. and didn't make any difference to the story. Right. I think a lot, the biggest ones I would actually say was the, the Butler character. Um, he annoyed the crud out of me. Oh, yeah. I felt like he was pointless as well, but really annoying and frustrating to me. And I didn't get his whole vibe of like, 
like wanting to like serial killer murder people. He was like a so- he said he was a sociopath. Right, like I didn't get that. I didn't understand where his sociopathic tendencies I were like know. coming from, and if, because they're treating that almost like it's comedic, but then at times he's literally killing people, like as he's going down the street right. and like you know hitting cars and blowing things up when he was driving. Um, yeah, uh, Anthony Hopkins. He's literally killing people. I'm like, that's not humorous to me. These are no. innocent people that are just walking around. So, um, a lot of things that I had with this movie, a couple of things. That yeah. Were, I, I totally agree. Disjointed. It was incoherent at times. I was yeah. like, wait, we just cut from what scene to go to what? What are we doing right now? <laughs> um, that I'm happened. I'm used to that, but that yes, whole, it was. That happened multiple times yeah. for me. And I was like, wait, what just happened? I felt like there were chunks of the movie that were missing. Like, yeah. what happened? Like, I mean, the uh, best examples of that are even at the very beginning where it's like, Merlin is this drunkard who just shows up and meets this robot and is like, give me your staff. Right. And he's like, no. And he's like, do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, then, and now we're all going to join forces together. It's like so weird. Yeah. Um, that, all that was just hilarious I with felt, the dragon. And This yeah. is the first time, actually I shouldn't say the first time, maybe in the second one too. This is the first, one of the first times I didn't feel like any of the stakes were real. They didn't do a good job at showing like the earth as a whole and the people. I felt like yeah. they were, you had Mark Wahlberg, you had the Knights of the Round Table from way back when. Yeah. And then uh, you have the military people. And then you have uh, dis- dysfunctional Cybertron. And like that was it. Like yeah. the Earth is going to explode. But I was like, I don't really care. Like I, yeah. I haven't seen anything <laughs> I don't on care Earth. If the Earth blows up. Because I mean, who do I care? Every, every who Transformers care has been that. Yeah. And like you said, there was nothing new. Yeah. I felt bored during a lot of it because yeah. there was nothing new. Yeah. I would agree that it felt smaller, but it. I almost felt like maybe that was on purpose because at times yes and at times no. And I think it was a fault with the film for sure because I didn't know what I was supposed to think about it. But they were constantly talking about like, you know, this could be the end of the world. And there's obviously been, you know, issues that have formed based upon the Transformers being there and these battles that they've had. And so I was thinking, well, like maybe the world is just a lot smaller now maybe there's a lot of people that have died maybe there's just not as much going on in the world and so that's why it feels smaller but then they would have lines like oh well she's off at college right and so it's like okay so you can just if that was the case then she's just going off to college and like there's just things that made it feel like that was that was not the case you know like especially when they went over to britain in england and they're just you know yeah. Everything was pretty much normal there. Well, they had, so so they, they made a big deal of showing that there's this task force. They call them the TRF. And I don't know what that stands for, but uh, something about totally, Transformers. They're the totally real force. To- totally, totally robot ridiculous force. Ridiculous <laughs> fanatics. Um, so what they did was they, were, they made a big deal of like, you know, uh, new Transformers are coming to Earth every day and it's threatening yeah. our lives of our people. Then you like you see the television channels, you see people playing polo, you see people doing like normal things. Like people don't care. It yeah. seems like people don't care. Yeah. Um and it's like not that big That's of a, a point. Deal. Exactly. People didn't seem to care in other moments, even though it felt like maybe they were trying to act like it was a really big deal on Earth. Yeah. Um my other big thing is I thought the humor was atrocious. Yeah. Um I didn't laugh at anything. No. Like and it was all it was a lot of the same humor and I know this now for a fact because it holds true with every Michael Bay film. Yeah. <laughs> Especially Transformers. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of his stamp and his own personal like, hey, I think this would be funny and I'm going to make let's do this joke. If he literally just got a scriptwriter to come in and just adjust his jokes, I think the scripts would probably be like twice as good. <laughs> I think it's the opposite. I think Michael Bay tweaks the scripts. I think I think a lot of the jokes you hear is him tweaking the scripts himself. I, I agree with that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like if he if he wrote the jokes and got somebody to come in and like tweak them. Right. But I, I agree because he's he's not the, the screenplay writer. You know what I mean? Right. You've got three different screenplay writers. You got four different story buys. Which those a lot of those might be because they were involved with the prior films, and they've got the writers room that they kind of do. Um, but it's definitely his humor style because so, that's played through in like every film. Yeah. It's always that. Kind of like there's a lot of stereotypes. There's yeah. a lot of things that are like uh, a little bit cringy at times. I'm like, that's that's like, that's like, that's kind of low humor. Yeah, you know? and he and, likes to play up that idea that like it's almost what they did with like Star Trek is a simple example of it. Like crazy things are happening, but people are cracking jokes while the crazy things are happening. He's just not, you know, good at but he's not good at it because yeah. they're just not that funny. And it yeah. kind of worked in the first film because, you know, uh, can't think of his name right now. Shia Shia LaBeouf is just a really tw- He's a manic kind of manic actor. And so that fits his natural style of humor is because he's always like tweaking, you know? It's like, what do you mean what's wrong? I'm a child. I'm always dirty. So it's like, (laughs) it makes sense for him to be that way. But for a lot of other actors and a lot of other people, they're not like that 
kind of an actor. They you know they can't do that style of humor necessarily. Yeah. Anthony Hopkins is not a actiony reactive like you know joke reactor kind of guy. I'm explaining that really poorly. Yeah. But you know there was the scene again where the butler's like driving him down the the street and they're like blowing up cars and he's like giving these reactionary jokes to like things that are happening. He's slipping off a car next to Yeah, him. <laughs> and it's like they weren't that funny because I'd like I don't look at Anthony Hopkins as this kind of a person, you know? Yeah, it, and okay, so a lot of the humor didn't work if it liked the characters and my other big thing was there was too many characters and they, he wanted, he had this idea, I think he, he wanted you to care about a lot of characters and he just threw new characters in there instead of giving lines to another character to help the story move forward like he just uh, instead of this person saying this, we need another person to say, we need physics and mathematics, <laughs> and so that's stupid. how we need to uh, that do was so this. Stupid. I didn't even know what the point of that was. No, you so know? there's a lot. It, it, there's a lot of those little things where people Robot just, religion trumps math, like science. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What, <laughs> there's something. That is. It's like, and it, there's a lot of pointless robot lore. Like, characters and people in there, side characters that didn't need to be in there. Yeah. Um, and... What I this this is gonna sound really cray like just totally okay cray cray let's off go. the wall you know <laughs> cray cray but I really feel like this movie would have been better as two films and just hear me out <laughs> there was certain elements that they built up that were completely pointless and they weren't there so either they cut a chunk of it out and they make one film which I will I will stand by this and say it, it never felt long to me and this Ooh. is the reason why like. The, the buildup that you have with Optimus Prime, right? I'm going to kind of spoil this a little bit, but this was in the trailers and everything, is that he's this big bad guy now, right? Like, he's he's turned on all he's the in... other, you know, and, like, they built that up so much, and then that's that's resolved in, like, five minutes. He's in the movie for ten minutes, guys. Right. He's and in that, the movie for ten minutes. If you had done this in two fi- I mean, it made it feel too short. Yeah. If they had moved that into two films, though, where in the first film is really him betraying them and doing all these horrible things, then maybe the end of the first film, he becomes a good guy, or in moving into the next film, right. he's still this bad guy. Like, that would have been more fulfilling, in a way. Yeah. And there was four or five different elements like that, where it's like, like even in the, the example of Merlin and the round table and all that kind of stuff, they could have given that a bit more time to really get fleshed out a little bit and talk about the relationship that the daughter had to murder. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Spoilers again, but like the relationship that was there and yeah. how that kind of got formed. And they could have talked about the night, the heritage of the night a little bit more instead of just like, you know, now we're going to give you them of this and that, 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 So I don't know. It just, it felt like they could have done more to kind of progress as it could have played into more of the side characters and explained why they were in these circumstances and why they're trying to do these things. I mean, it it just it, it felt like it could have been a little. They felt like everybody was just too compressed and too short in there, and they should have just cut them out, or they should have stretched it into more films. Yeah, which I know that's it's horrible to say. Okay, so, horrible because so you I'm want saying Michael I want to make a it's sequel. Like I'm saying I want a sequel. Yeah, I don't want a sequel. <laughs> I want them to stop making these movies or get a new director. Yeah, I'd love to see a new director get yep. these. It's kind of the same thing with Resident Evil. Yeah, you know, it's like it's a a franchise I could like. Just get Paul W. S. Anderson out of there. <laughs> there you go. If they get him out of there and they put Which somebody else they're in there, they're gonna do. Right, because the first Resident Evil, not an amazing film, but enjoyable, entertaining. Yeah. You know, and the first Transformers, not an amazing film, but enjoyable and entertaining. Oh, yeah, I, you know? I enjoyed the first Transformers a bit, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a, like a it's a B. It's it's, it's kind of like what the Fast beast, and the Furious movies are ranked. now to me. Like super fun, kind of like yeah. oh, this is fun. Yeah. Um Hey, so this is a really interesting story. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is going back to the script and in Michael Bay and just kind of his isms. And uh, these movies are now being produced. And I wholeheartedly agree with this. And, and I heard this is that they're they're being made for an international market. Absolutely. And and there's some stories out there um, with, uh, I think, Gerard Carmichael. And he had some jokes. And Michael Bay has a sense and he knows this. He has them change lines on set. And he says it because... Those jokes aren't going to play in in a foreign market. In a foreign market, yeah. So he changes stuff just to accommodate that, you know. Whether and I think that probably, obviously, sacrifices how funny it could have been, you know, with these yeah. people riffing on things. And I, 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 I yeah. get that, but I would also say that as of this point, as of this point, I'm not maybe ten years from now where where we'll be, but. The American Hollywood, L.A. film, you know, media world is yeah. still the leader, preeminent creationist creation group for that for films for sure for television. We're the we're the peak, the peak. You could make claims that China's getting there. Yeah, England does some good stuff, but for the most part, we're like the tops. If they're making a film that's successful in the United States, 
it'll play and be successful in foreign markets. Yeah. Maybe not as quite as much, but it will become more successful. So it's like you shouldn't make, what I'm trying to say is, I don't think you should try and make your film for the lowest common denominator. Like you pick the best and you go for the best and then hope that that kind of translates down as best as it can. Yeah. To, and I'm not, that's not a, again, that's not an attack on anybody from a foreign country. I'm purely just talking about films here. Yeah. You know? That's my my perspective on it. No, I get it, and I just think that that he has that in mind. He knows that these films aren't, especially this one, they're not doing very well here domestically. Yeah, but they're doing they're they're you know double and tripling. That's the weird thing about him, he set. is he's like a idiot savant. You know this Michael Bay guy. <laughs> I mean, you can't think. I cannot think of very many other directors that I just know are going to make a certain kind of film in a certain kind of way. And do it just, you know, he he is in a way, I mean, you talk about auteur theory, which is the idea that a director is like the author, that like the artist, and he kind of paints the picture and creates it with this language that he has. And some directors have a very strong sense of that, and some don't. He has a very strong sense of his, like, authorship, of his creation his of films. brand. His brand. Yeah. And I respect him for that. And it's like, he knows what it is. He's intelligent enough to make it work. It's just, it's like 15 years outdated. Right. You know? It's and like it's, The Rock. Right. I mean, I loved The Rock, the yeah. original one. I mean, in a way, I also really liked Armageddon, even though yeah. I like hated it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's elements to his stories at times that have resonated and have worked. But his, and this is the same with pretty much any, you know, auteur type of filmmaker, they eventually get to the point where their style, their feel to their films their themes and their the way that they choose their their different angles and everything yeah that becomes outdated yep and I agree. he the only reason that he's still around is because he's still able to pull in a huge segment of the market from certain places yep you know well, so it's tough um i mean yeah. i would still respect the guy if i met him i'd shake his hand and be like dude you are a very successful filmmaker yeah. that's done amazing do projects explosions yeah. so good i love <laughs> you, the explosions that your you slow-mo <laughs> is so good let me tell you yeah your um, color palette and yeah. sound design, pristine. Well, it's almost becoming like it's almost becoming a joke in and of itself to make fun and attack Michael Bay. I feel like because everybody attacks Michael Bay and hates on him, and I and I'm not saying like oh my gosh he's revolutionized cinema or anything, but he definitely has had a strong impact on cinema. <laughs> he has definitely brought in lots and lots and lots of money, and he's definitely been a lot more successful in the industry than I could lay claim to. So that's all I'm saying. There's a clip I saw. So I'm um, giving him a little bit of something. There's you know? a clip. It's funny. <laughs> this is totally, it's kind of unrelated, but yeah. there's a clip on South Park of where Michael Bay comes in and like is talking. He's like talking to somebody in an interrogator room. He's like, he's like, and then this car is going to come in and it's going to go <laughs> boom. And then this other car is going to come in and it's going boom, yeah. boom. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, it's And that's how like funny. people like to imagine him. Yeah. And it's funny to joke about that. But I mean, this guy, I mean, he's, he's still, he's pumping out movies and you know, I mean, they're, they're movies. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Anyways. Hey. Yes. Dude, rate this thing. I'm going to give this one a D plus. Hey. I'm going to give it a uh, 68. It's my ranking oh, for nice. it. Oh, so. nice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if you're going to go higher or lower. Nope. I am going to go. <laughs> ooh. It just depends on how low. I'm gonna go okay. 55. Wow, 55. Yeah. I would have thought that I would have had probably the lower. No, I, I think I just. I actually, I as mean, as an emotional person, if I get like really irritated with something, yeah, it like oh, that makes sense. Yeah, like, it really rubs like me the wrong way, and against... it's like it feels like they're they're making fun of me like emotionally, yeah. and I like I got to be like oh, this just kind of hurts me. Actually. Yeah, I, I was bored by it, and I didn't. I mean, I thought like I said, the last 15, 20 minutes or so, the last action piece was cool in a way. Um, but it wasn't like the worst film I've seen this year. Yeah, well. And I, we've, we've talked about this as well. Like you asked, you texted me and you were like, you know, how does it rate in comparison to like the other films in the yeah. series? And I'm like, when I started, when I sat down, I really thought about it. I'm like, well, it wasn't as bad as the second. It wasn't anywhere near as good as the first. It kind of fits somewhere in that, like the rest of the films, like the third was just really, really boring and tedious. So it's a little bit above the third, but it's kind of like in there with the the rest right. of them. No, I know? gotcha. Anyways, so yeah. that uh, will kind of wrap up our our synopsis slash summary of Transformers: The Last Night. Next, we're going to talk Achoo. about another fantastic Achoo. film that Joel Yo. got a chance to Yo. see. 
Yo. I was, was going to try and rap. Yo, okay, get your rap on. Yeah. And this movie came out two weeks ago, but we didn't get a chance to check it out because there was like 30 movies that came out that week. Every time I try to think about me rapping, it feels like I could do it. Uh, yo, yeah. But then it never, it's just like me speaking Spanish. Sometimes <laughs> I, I like, I understand people that speak Spanish, but then Hola. when I try and speak it, I'm like, Yo tengo un Porque? gato. Yeah. yeah. That's how I am with rapping. It's always like, my name is Joel and I'm here to say, and then it all falls apart. <laughs> it's a horrible rap. Welcome to another episode of Rapping with Joel. Yeah, we just had like 80% of our listeners just like yep, shifted I the I had podcast enough off. of that, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the film we're talking about, All Eyes on Me, and uh, like we talked about, Matt, you haven't had a chance to see this. Right. Um, this film, uh, it's... The synopsis for this is tells the true and untold story of prolific rapper, actor, poet, and activist Tupac Shakur. It is directed by Denny, or, sorry, Benny Boom, which I still think is just an amazing name. Um, it stars uh, Demetrius Ship Jr., uh, Denai Gurira, uh, Keith Graham, uh, Hill, Hill Harper, Annie Elonze, uh, Lauren Cohen, Keith Robinson, Jamal Woolard. I, I'm not going to go into all these okay. people. <laughs> um, it's got a pretty good sized cast of characters. The interesting, one of the interesting things about the casting, just in and of itself, two things. One, there's two actors from The Walking Dead uh, yep. that are in this one, which is actually crazy to me. I was like, how did they get both Lauren Con, Lauren Conrad and, and uh, uh, Denai? Michonne? Yeah, in this. I don't know how that one happened, but it was kind of interesting. Um, and then. The other thing was, is th- beyond Tupac's character, uh, Demetrius, this actor Demetrius, nobody really, they looked like vague, like resemblances of themselves. I really thought, because they got all the licensing for all the original music and everything like that, I really thought that they might have some actual cameos from like mm. some of the real yeah, people. people that are referenced in this, because a lot of them are still alive. Yeah. And yeah, they've aged, but they could, you know, maybe do something digitally or something to them, but they didn't, you know? Yeah. So everybody in here, I'm trying to like, okay, you're that person. And I do want to get to the good parts, but I will say that that was a difficult thing for me because I'm not, you know, we joke about it, but I'm not like the biggest like rap guy. So like, really? I don't, yeah. I mean, sure hip hop and rap. Us. my sister was huge into that kind of stuff, which I'm <laughs> outing her, I guess. Uh, like way in the past when she was like in high school and stuff, she was like really into R and B and hip hop and rap and stuff. I wasn't too much. I I liked heavier metal and like heavy metal and indie. You were and in rock a metal job. I was totally in a metal. I yeah, cannot just, imagine yeah, you. Just very odd stage okay. of my life there a little bit. But I was too, but I just didn't. Really, I, I couldn't you, imagine yeah. that either. That's yeah. crazy. We will have to talk metal after. Yeah. <laughs> we we'll have to talk some, some metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I just didn't get into it too much, but I I'm familiar with a lot of the names. You know what I mean? I'm familiar with Snoop Dogg. I'm familiar with Tupac. I'm I'm familiar with the the big roles that like a lot of these people have played in the industry, um, despite not being super familiar with their whole documentary. And but even even still, because a lot of the times I didn't know who these actors were and they right. didn't like introduce them in a way that I would recognize them. It was really hard to kind of connect with them. Be, the way that yeah. they were treating them in the film was like, this is that person and i'm like well i don't really know you so i'm sorry <laughs> yeah i'm sorry like i know who you are i think but i don't really know you so there was a, a lot of that going on in the film where they were treating elements as almost this like i don't even know how you'd explain it like they were referential they were like they were trying to like almost say like this is look at this moment that you've heard all about that we are now going to show you. This is that famous thing that happened and it was like a check off on a box. It was like, we're just going to have this part where he gets in this fight and we're going to have this part where, you know, his first album comes out and then this part where, you know, he gets into this uh, court hearing and gets sentenced. So it felt really boring after a while because I'm like, I didn't realize that you could present a story about a guy like Tupac who obviously has a pretty crazy, I mean, the guy ended up getting killed at 25 getting shot to death right spoilers <laughs> spoilers so, um and there's a lot of people that think he's still alive though there is yeah. yes which they they don't necessarily give you that at the end of the film which the end of the film was actually one of the toughest parts that i had for this oh, okay I gotcha. um, i'm gonna give you the good parts in a second i apologize um but i really did have a hard time with that because it got very tedious and boring yeah because i was like okay well now we're going to talk about this part of tupac story and this part even though i didn't know what the parts <laughs> were i knew that that's what they were doing so so the good parts um Demetrius, good looking guy for the role. I felt like he looked a lot like um, Tupac. Right. I thought he did a decent enough job. Uh, Denai um, felt like she was really trying to like sell it. Um, she played this character, Afeni uh, Shakur, who's his mom. 
And she really felt like she was trying to give it 110% with this role, like this was going to be her Oscar-nominated role. But unfortunately, the material just was not it there. It was not there, yeah. Right. The dialogue was not strong enough. The role was not strong enough um, for her to really, you know, get a nomination, I would think, from this anywhere close to it. Um, it's not that she did a bad job. It just, she couldn't. She, there's, no, like, no way that you could really pull that out. Right. Um, the... Cinematography was okay. Um, there wasn't anything about it that really, beyond like the actual um, quality of the film, and by that I mean like the colorization and the cameras that they're using with the lenses, it really felt like it was just a slightly above like a made-for-TV kind of movie okay. style. Lifetime-ish. Yeah, like a slightly above that. Okay. Again, because they're using high, you know, cin- cinematic quality lenses and cinematic quality cameras and good colorization and everything like that. Um, so... That was maybe a good part of it to me. Okay. Um, there were moments as well in the script where even though I definitely think they were trying to like oversell it at certain parts, um, there was emotional connection to the the different parts that the characters were going through and that they were saying. And you really at, at times kind of did feel a little bit, at least I did, for the characters okay. in the film. No, that's good. Um, so there was an emotional connection that was there. Um, at times and the sound was good the music was good i was, mean was they're using the lights music yeah i mean there was a pretty good amount i mean they kind of hit most of the major songs i don't know all of tupac's more songs, importantly but... was there the lyrics and then little bouncing ball that went over the words as they were being there rapped? was okay, no cool. no but i did hear that they did <laughs> screenings where in in certain net areas they did that are you serious no i'm just kidding <laughs> i was like what that is outrageous <laughs> it's for all the white folks that go there and just like and i'm rapping with tupac this is awesome like, that might have actually helped the film that sounds really bad um but they had like so many elements. I'm going to start getting into the bad stuff here where it, like I said, it screamed out like made for TV movie one. It felt like everything was just checking off boxes. There was this over-reliance on slow motion at different times to try and create these like epic, like deep emotional moments of like, you know, well, somebody's doing this thing that's really bad or really crazy and really awesome. Okay. So we're going to create this like really slow motion like moment. So you feel how intense this is. And so like, that was really obvious The the dialogue was all like, like super upfront. And what I mean by that is like, usually like when I write or when I read good writing or see good writing in a film, the dialogue is always kind of like one layer removed. Like if you want to say to somebody, I hate you. You don't always just say, I hate you. Yeah. You might say it, but you might say something like, your shirt's ugly. And that means because of the context and the situation, when you look at the way that it's shot and the way that the person's acting, that like they hate that person. You know what I mean? It's it's rare for people to say exactly what they're thinking. Right. Yeah. And everything was like, maybe at times it was like once removed, but for the most part, it was like, I am angry at you. So I shall tell you why I am now angry at you. There's like a scene where like Tupac is in the theater and, and he's like watching this movie that's like premiering that he was in and his manager is sitting next to him, I guess. I think it's his manager, the director. And he like looks over at Tupac and he goes, you did a great job. This is, this is going to be big. Like this, you're on your way. This is going to be big for you. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so he's on his way. He couldn't just, he couldn't just like looked at him and been like, nice. Like yeah. something simple. I don't even know what he would have said, the vernacular, you know, but like right. something that would have been a lot less <laughs> on your nose and like obvious. Um, so I had problems with that. I had problems overall with the structure of the film too. They did this really dumb thing the first half of the movie or so where they were like bouncing back and forth from this interview. So it kind of starts off with him getting this interview done by this, I don't know who the guy was. They never really introduced who like the the news guy was. He was some news reporter and he's doing this like ongoing story about him while he's in jail yeah. for what you find out later is because of uh, a sexual assault allegation or okay. inappropriate touching or something like that, <laughs> okay. which I didn't even really know was a thing. I guess that's a thing. Um, but he's in jail for that. And so they're doing this interview with him, but that only lasts like the first half of the movie. Okay. And it, it's weird because they start you in the future and then they jump to the past and then eventually the timelines meet and then it kind of goes forward. But that's like halfway through the film. And I really, every single time they jumped to the news guy and doing the interview because they're wandering around the prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is taking place. The interview is taking place over the course of a couple of days. It completely took you out of the moment. Oh, really? Of anything okay. that was emotionally happening. It was just like these dips. And it was like this strongly kind of 
intense moment would happen and then it would go boom back to this interview where it's just like hey we're just talking to each other about these events so that was stupid and then the whole first half of the movie for the most part wasn't even really about Tupac oh, okay. it was about his mom it was about his his supposed father it was about the circumstances that he's moving into all these different places his relatives um, it's about you know the girls that he's in the girl that he's interested in kind of um, in the in the script um, Jada Pinkett you know yeah. which kind of this thing with about his sister about you know his his hood buddy and all sorts. So it's not really about him. It's more about the like, events that are surrounding him yeah, yeah, and yeah. things that are happening to him. And the main character, I will say Demetrius, although he looked the role, there was like this like blankness to his expression a lot of times. I got so that from really the hard. trailers. Yeah, it was yeah. like really, there's a lot of emotion that needs to like weirdly at times come from a person's eyes. And it just, there was nothing coming. It wasn't like emoting his eyes. It didn't feel like he was connected, which really felt like a, a basic like directorial type thing right. is getting your character into the moment. It really didn't feel like the character was getting into the moment a lot of times. Later on in the script, it got a lot better. Yeah. But a lot of that later on was more of just like, it was simpler. It was easier. I think there was just kind of one emotion of just anger. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to talk too, too much about this again because I could go on for a while. I felt like this movie was in a way worse than Transformers. Okay. Um, it's just sad because I really wanted to see a story about, Tupac that yeah. kind of like the comparison point obviously it's a different story different time period but if you walk look at walk the line you know that movie starts out with an inciting incident of sorts that kind of formats this perspective that Johnny Cash has and then it shows kind of his progression and working through his inner demons and his falls and his faults and his goods and his bads. This movie was like, it shows a little bit of Tupac and Tupac's like generally the the whole way through the script is kind of like this. He's just this nice guy, you know, that has these bad things that happen to him at times. And it's all just this persona that he's kind of built up around himself. And then every once in a while he'll go a bit too far. And because of that, bad things will happen to him. Yeah. But it's always like, you know, Oh, well it's like, they were trying to like, uh, like puppy glove him. Like they were trying to be like, well, he's a nice guy. He just had some really bad mistakes that he made because of the stuff that was going on around him. Like, it sounds like they would have been better because I felt like this was a pretty good movie. They could have gone the straight out of Compton route. Yeah, yeah like yeah. that's what I was hoping for. That's what I was expecting because that was an entertaining. They actually had it wasn't Tupac was in it for like a second or two, right? In Straight Out of Compton, I don't remember. But like a cameo, maybe not. Maybe not. Like I don't I can't know. Remember for some reason. But it, it the I was reading actually a really funny review. Um by uh, one of the guys over at Slate Magazine. And they talk about um, a couple years back, they did this thing at Coachella. And I don't know if you remember this, but it was like this big deal. because the hologram? Yeah, they did the hologram. Yeah. And it everybody, I remember watching that and thinking like, that's weird, kind of cool, but kind of weird. It's like he's dead, but he was never at Coachella. And that's kind of how this movie felt. It felt like it was kind of just weird and strange um, at times. And it didn't really feel like it was really Tupac that was there. It felt like it was more about that period of time and those people and that circumstance. Yeah. And Tupac was the main leading thing that we were following through the story, but it was just, it was kind of bland because of that. It felt really long. And the big, this is like the one thing that just killed me. It takes some pretty bad editing for me to like take notice of how bad the editing could be. (laughs) And you know, the guy that they actually have doing the editing behind this film is, um, excuse me, sorry. No, you're good. You're good. I was just burping there. There you go. So uh, he's actually a pretty well-known editor. I mean, the guy, Joel Cox, um, he's done a lot of really big films. Uh, He did uh, Million Dollar Baby, uh, Gran Torino, Mystic River, Prisoners. Eastwood films. Yeah, he's done a lot of Eastwood films. And, you know, he's, he's done some really good projects. This film, maybe it just wasn't his style. It literally felt like one of the most disjointedly edited films that I've ever seen in my entire life, there was literally a scene. I'm not going to go through everything, but like there's a part at the very end and spoilers, you know, Tupac dies and get shot at the end. Unfortunately, it's a bad thing, but yeah. it happens and they put it in the film, but there's like a scene where they're building up to it and it actually had done a pretty effective job, but it, the whole thing felt very disjointed. It was like, now we've got to get these quick emotional appeals in before we kill Tupac. That's how it felt. And they're getting to the point where he gets shot and it's literally this car is pulling up next to him and again, it's in slow-mo and they do like an overhead shot and you actually see one of the shots getting fired and then it cuts to everybody's just sitting there talking again and the car hasn't even pulled up yet. And so oh, it's like, weird. It's, it like it jumped backwards and forwards in time and like he cut it too late it's like lazy. to get the shot. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, they literally just missed the fact that one of the bullets got shot and they didn't, they needed to cut it a few seconds sooner. Um, it, so it like the whole movie felt that way though. Like this, like 
well, we need to just jump to something here. So then they would like just jump cut to some other random thing. And that also contributed to the whole like checkbox type feel, yeah. I think. Um, and then the whole movie. Um, so the, the the whole movie kind of builds up to the, you know, the epic climactic end. Yeah. Epic. I, I'm not, I shouldn't say epic, epic, but the kind of sad, tragic end of, you know, Tupac. And I really wanted to kind of get choked up about it. And cause this is a real guy with a real impact. I didn't listen to his music, but he had a big impact on a lot of people's lives. Um, I really wanted to get like, kind of like heartfelt connection to it in a way. And it had kind of gotten there. And then they do this really, oh, such a like, amateur it felt like such an amateur stupid i'm sorry dude that edited this but or i'm sorry that directed this um i love your name but not a great choice here the very end of the movie they do like this overhead slow-mo thing where he's like laying on the ground and they start playing this like ridiculously over the top like gospel music and it's like the (laughs) whole movie they've never played any gospel music they haven't done anything with this style it doesn't rem like bring you back to any like he wouldn't go to church at one point and hear gospel music right his mom didn't talk about god it's just like this most like how can we have like the saddest kind of because it's playing like you know you will see jesus in the (laughs) gates and then this like what i'm not even kidding you this like and they're in las vegas this like white smoke starts to like float across like the the edges of the screen like so it's like he's like entering heaven like at the really? v- yeah and oh I was my like, gosh the only, and this is what slate said in the article that was funny it's like the only they had the good graces to not put his hands out like he was like dying like jesus on the cross i mean that's <laughs> literally like what they made it into at the very end and it really just i mean it leaves you with a bad taste but it really just gives you a taste for like kind of how everything was in the film yeah just bad taste at different times about different things and it it just things didn't need to happen. It was way too long. It, this film was film was two hours and twenty minutes. They could have shortened it down to an hour and forty five easily. Gotten rid of like a lot of stuff that didn't even need to. Unfortunately, I you know it, as good as she did at times, his mom didn't even need to be in the film really. The, the whole subplot. I mean, they could have done like a quick five to ten minute thing in the very beginning of the film when he's a kid, showing the the circumstances around him. That's kind of helped to fashion because. It doesn't. It, it doesn't touch back later in the film where he's kind of. The whole purpose of the theme of the film, the beginning, is you know he lives in this harsh environment. Black Panthers, you know, uh, you know, black people are being mistreated and and attacked and not attacking that message at all. But like that doesn't really play out the rest of the film. There's like little moments where that like theme kind of sort of comes back in, but it's always like circumstantial. They don't. Like, they don't stick to it. No, it's like they needed some like thematic thing to make this deeper. So then they play that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and it's like, well, if that had been like the theme all the way through, then I would have been like more well connected with it. But at this point, it doesn't even feel like you're using it for anything beyond just like, well, we need something a little bit deeper. So, yeah, yeah. By the way, Tupac was in Straight Outta Compton just for like a two minute scene. He was doing okay. like recording work in the studio. You're right. Yeah. Um. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so, interesting. Yeah. So rate, I'm not gonna spend any more time on this. Rate, rate right, this beast. Gone on for a little while. I'm gonna give this one a pretty low. I'm gonna give this one. It's actually getting a 31 percent. Whoa. Yeah. Thir- hey, and that doesn't that that actually that's not surprising. The uh, box office for this movie dropped 80 percent from week one to week two, which yeah. is really bad. Yeah, it's got a 20 uh, percent. And just and just if well. if you guys aren't familiar with the whole box office thing, you can expect a, a, a decent movie. Uh, it's okay if it, it if it goes to that fifty percent range. If yeah. it drops about fifty percent, that's okay. Yeah. If you have a movie like Wonder Woman, which has been doing fantastic, it's staying it within the thirty to forty percent range right. from week to week. It was which number is, three this week, which is incredible. This, which so, is yeah, after it's been um, out this long, and especially with the big films that have come out, it has staying power. It has yeah. the, the legs, as they would say, yeah. to keep kind of going. And, yeah. It was a bad sign to me that the the audience score is at sixty four percent, and the the tomato meter for critics was at twenty percent because. Generally, sometimes with films that like there's a there's a huge disparity between you know critic scores and and viewer scores, then it's like well sometimes I can agree with the viewers a lot more and just like non critic type perspective. So I was like kind of hopeful, but even sixty four percent is not huge for yeah. Rotten Tomatoes from from like a, a viewer perspective. Yeah, uh, for this kind of film, and I love biopics. We've talked about this. Yep. I really want a good. I haven't seen a good biopic come out in a long while. I need one this year. So. Uh, Good tie-in right here at the end. If any of you listeners are out there and there's a good biopic, maybe I haven't had a chance to see this year, send it our way. Yeah, let, let us know. know. What it is. Let, let us know for out. sure. Yeah. Well, that's going to wrap up our uh, movie review segment. Um, yeah, let us know. Again, we're going to uh, re- reach out to us at uh, our Facebook page, which is slash Real Review Media, Instagram, Twitter, at Real Review Media. 
uh, our uh, website, realreviewmedia.com. But yeah, let us know. Uh, keep us updated on what, what you uh, maybe either liked or didn't like. Maybe you loved Transformers and All Eyes on Me. I don't know. If that's kind of, if that's your jam, then awesome. Good for you. Somebody's got to like them. Yeah. Hey, you know? so um, let us know. You can email us at realreviewmedia at gmail.com. Do but it, um, do it. other than that, Joel, you got anything else? Nope. I'm good. All right. Hell, hey, hey, it's been real. <laughs> it's been real. <laughs>